you know, I hate to do things not in my district, um, but uh, Senator Rosa Bloom has uh, graciously said I could venture in. Uh, I, on the other hand, ask a few people to uh, ask permission when electives come to my district. <laughs> Unless, but, yeah. And for information, what I'm going to do, just this is kind of my first venture out since, not first venture out, but with you anyway, here. Uh, Senate District 5 is my district, is primarily along the coast. Uh, Lincoln County entirety, western parts of Benton, Philomath and Monroe, uh, west, uh, Lane County, uh, western part, western part of Douglas, western, or uh, the, all the way around Coos Bay, the city of Coos Bay. I don't get abandoned dunes. I'm a golfer. That was disappointing. Um, and at Charleston. So, uh, Lane County, I now go all the way almost to the Fern Ridge Reservoir. So it's uh, my moniker on the Senate floor is uh, the guy from the coast, but I always apologize to Flomouth and I'm going to bring the coast to them. So <laughs> let me take a little bit of time to share with you who I am and what has kind of grounded me into my position of, of uh, state Senate. I retired actually in 2006 from that metropolitan area north um, and to teach to Lake City in 2006. Uh, my wife of uh, 53 years got tired of me around the house, uh, suggested I do something, and so I uh, split my nasty habits of golf uh, with local government. I spent 12 years in local government in Lincoln City, six of those as mayor of Lincoln City. And it's really from that arena um, got me interested in what makes up a healthy community, uh, a lot of pressure around economic development and diversity in economic development. And at the same time, what I was finding was I was disgruntled with the state government because uh, they appeared to be, uh, in my opinion, stepping on my toes as local government. Uh, so now, unfortunately, I am one, uh, so I have to be real careful uh, when I'm on the floor and what I vote for. But some things you'll hear from me when I floor speeches and stuff is, as a former mayor, da da da, or as a person from the coast, you've forgotten us. Um, I'm real strong on local control, local government, uh, or local, local control, whether it's uh, school districts, uh, health districts, uh, uh, cities you know i like to push it back down as far as i can back to my foundational kind of things i retired from 35 years in real estate finance um so housing is a big part of my life and has been i'm on the uh i'm vice chair of the senate housing committee and have been um i that's the primary area of my interest along with child care um, the other is education, and I include early learning, early learning up through the uh, uh, higher education component. I'm on the Senate <coughs> Education Committee. And then uh, my fourth area is really uh, health cares and all three, physical, behavioral, and oral. So when you think of those three, I, I view them as pillars that make up if function well, a healthy community. And they then arrive uh, in a position for economic development. Because as a mayor, I was always challenged with what are you doing lately around economic development for the coast? Because some of you may feel, and it's true, the coast is heavy tourism. And diversity would be a good thing. We've done a great job in tourism of spreading out what we call the shoulder uh, areas away from the summer, trying to bring people in um, on the shoulder months, and that's, that's helped uh, the economy. But in reality, you do need diversity of uh, jobs, uh, living wage jobs. And so, you know, I, I kept pushing those to people and saying, look, why would pick whomever a uh, fictitious company come to the coast there's no housing affordable at any rate or even accessible if it's a family what about child care 
We don't have a lot of child care, if any. We certainly don't have a big uh, facility for child care. So it's a challenge. And then, you know, the education, even though you end, we end up in Lincoln County and some of the other counties doing the average on ratings and stuff through education or with the state, we're still, as a state, underperforming. So it's a challenge. And when you're in metropolitan areas, you have ways, more ways to supplement uh, families' uh, educational needs and, and the young people. So I, I just, and then you know, I'm also, by the way, on a, a health district um, into my third, fourth year term. So I've learned way too much about um, hospitals and the health industry. Um, but you know, for me, if you view those again, those are real important for any kind of community, healthy community, and in order to position yourself uh, better as a community for economic development. So that that's what I've worked on continue to work on, and fortunately my finance in the Senate have, alluded, have supported that. I'm also on full ways and means, um, so I, I see uh, the, the budgets, uh, bills, and policy bills with uh, money coming through, and then I'm on the subcommittee of ways and means for natural resources. So I'm, I'm very well positioned. Um, on the on in the Senate in the in the uh, whole legislative chamber to to educate myself and it's been the great. This is my first term. I'm ending it. This, uh, this is my fourth session. Just about ready to complete. So I'll be campaigning after we're done for a chance for four more years. So with that, I, I think uh, we can. I'm sure through questions. Because um, I, I hate to do these things and tell you what I like. I'd rather hear, you know, what's interesting to you and try to supplement that. So, so thank you. Thank you. Before we continue, if there's an empty chair next to you, there's several people standing. So please go. Feel free to take any of these chairs that are empty. You don't have to. You don't have to stand. There's one more over there too. Yeah, there's one here, and I think there's a couple in the back. So those of you who are standing in the back, if you want to take any of those, or if you want to continue standing, fine. Okay. All right. All right. Well, good morning. It's so great to see all of you here. I love living in this community where even when there is a beaver ball game, there are so many of you here. And many of you, I spent my morning seeing your names in my email box trying to catch up from the last few weeks. Uh, and I'm giving up on House Bill 4148. I am voting for it. I've already voted for it in ways and means. It's passed off the House floor. And I believe there are hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of emails in my box, probably from some of you. So just know, yes, I'm voting yes. It's a good bill and I'm co-sponsor of the bill and many thanks to Peter Committee for bringing it to my attention before the start of session so that I had the opportunity to sign on to that to that legislation. Um, one of the things that my uh, friend Senator Anderson did not mention is that I've had the opportunity to serve the entirety of several sessions with um, the good Senator Anderson who um, was present for all of our sessions last year. So uh, Senator Anderson is one of my colleagues on the other side of the aisle that is returning and not impacted by the by the recent court, court decision. Um, so, and I just have to say, I have forgiven him for stealing Philomath. <laughs> but Philomath is, is very fortunate. Uh, and I think we'll do well to um, have some of that connection to Coast and other communities that have um, similar regional needs and interests. And once you've loved Philomath, you always love Philomath. So Philomath now has lots of representation in the, in the legislature. So we are... At the end of the short session, and even though we've only been there for four weeks, was this just week four? It feels like a really long time. <laughs> it's really hard to remember conversations that I had last Monday, let alone on February 1st. And we have really moved some monumental, really difficult things through this session, and I'm sure that you're going to have questions about, about some of those things. I wanted to mention first uh, a couple of things that I've been working on 
and that I know uh, are of particular interest to this community. So one is that it was a great honor to be able to carry a resolution honoring Senator Tro on the Senate floor last week. Uh, Joanne was able to be there with us on the floor. And just like at his memorial service that many of you were at, the hearing was remarkable because people just kept turning out. Um, some people that had never actually met Senator Tro but had been impacted by his work, not just in the legislature, but in retirement. And also had the opportunity to carry uh, um, a memorial to Steve Druckenmiller, who's the second longest serving elected official in Lynn County, uh, the Lynn County clerk. And a little known fact about Lynn County is that it was the first county to pilot Spanish language ballots. Uh, Steve Druckenmiller was a huge advocate for vote by mail, automatic voter registration, and language accessibility in the ballot. And, and Lynn County often does not get enough credit for the innovations that, that happen in Lynn County. There's great things that happen in Lynn County. Um, Many, many letters uh, I have been receiving about the issue related to the Corvallis Clinic. Some of those letters are coming directly related to the Corvallis Clinic. Some of them are coming related to Optum and UHS. Some of them are coming related to What's the House bill number? House bill 4130, something like that. Did I get the number right? Yes. That is the, uh, the corporate um, ownership of medicine. The first thing that I want to make clear, I, I actually support that bill, but it will have absolutely no impact on the Corvallis Clinic situation. The, um, the, the issues inside and the questions around the corporate, corporate influence on medicine those issues are at play broadly in the conversation about the Corvallis Clinic. But this other bill is not in effect yet, will not impact that decision, and it actually has a seven-year runway. The issue with the Corvallis Clinic, uh, the, uh, the uh, Oregon Health Authority announced this week that they were extending the consideration period again to March 8th. I know that is of significant concern to to many people. And it has become a very challenging situation for me that is very um, illustrative of this entire legislative session, which feels a lot like choosing between choices I don't want to choose between. And in this one, you have Optum, which is part of UHS. I have very, very significant concerns about that due to other work that I've done in the behavioral health area, um, what's happened in other parts of the state. I know my colleague, um, Senator Weber, has had significant issues with a similar company up in the Tillamook area. Uh, and the fact that we are very reliant on the Corvallis Clinic in this community. I bet there is not a single one of us in this room that does not have at least one specialist at the Corvallis Clinic. And I can tell you um, what was surprising to me over the last two weeks in particular were the conversations with physicians um, at that clinic who are, I, I think, facing an existential threat of running out of money and maybe not having a clinic in a few weeks. Yeah. So I am glad not the Oregon Health Authority and that I don't have to make this decision. What I ended up doing this week was taking time to make telephone calls um, all the way up to the governor. I actually spoke directly with Governor Kotek to talk about the challenge of the Corvallis Clinic, my overall concerns with corporate medicine, but also the real risk that our community faces in terms of access to health care. And I told her I have no idea what I'm asking you for. I just feel like there is a there is a crisis that is about to occur in my community regardless of the decision. And I need you to be aware of what that is. One of the things that I learned in that process that was actually reassuring to me is that there, there isn't someone that I can call or you can call that can change what that decision is by the Oregon Health Authority. That process is designed to be apolitical. I asked for a briefing. I can't get a briefing because they have that, that political protection around it. The governor can't get a briefing on what it is. And I ultimately, though I would love to have more information than I have today, I think that is the way that it should be, where you have non-political professionals that are looking at these important issues who cannot be swayed by a Republican, a Democrat, a governor, a speaker of the House, a president of the Senate, a county commissioner. So I, I know that that issue is just really under the surface for a lot of people in this room and really a lot of people in the community, especially those that are working for the Corvallis Clinic. I, truly some of the most heartbreaking conversations I've had in my time in the legislature have been um, with physicians that we all know and trust uh, who similarly feel, feel stuck. Um, 
just a couple other things I'll mention really quickly. Last session, you might recall, I talked a lot about a bill called Senate Bill 819, and it had to do with shortened school days for kids. Uh, that was in the context of a very large lawsuit that was moving forward. We were five years into this class action lawsuit. The state was not doing well based on all of the court's findings. We were able to pass that law. I have a bill this session that makes a couple of tweaks. Um, but the night before last, very late, uh, the federal uh, court judge, Ann Aiken, um, issued uh, a dismissal of the case on the basis that uh, Senate Bill 819 was uh, resolved the issues. And I just wanted to read, because it was so um, controversial, plaintiff's lawyers, this is from Ann Aiken in her official um, finding, plaintiff's lawyers embarked on a worthy path to make a difference, and they did, for all of Oregon's public school children attending school with disabilities. Plaintiff's dogged advocacy to bring this landmark case caught the attention of the Oregon legislature, and the legislative branch carried the baton over the finish line to enact the very protections plaintiffs zealously sought. Defendant's responsiveness to the allegations in this lawsuit and her, her Herculean effort to quickly implement Senate Bill 819 demonstrates the commitment to the public to correcting the systemic deficiencies identified by the plaintiff, plaintiffs and the jointly retained expert. The court commends the lawyer's diligent work in this important case, and therefore the case is dismissed. So that, that felt good. Um, and I think that, and just to be a good partner to Disability Rights Oregon, I think their point is we also need to protect what we passed as this was pulled off and not chip away at it because we don't want to land back in court, and we do have to make sure that districts and ODE actually comply with that law moving forward. Two things that uh, folks here have uh, communicated with me a lot, I know it will be in the questions, are the big uh, land use and housing bills. Last session, I voted no on the land use bill. This session, I voted yes. Um, it was less hard than I thought it would be when we got there because the, the process continue to change even up and through the session. What I had specifically asked for last session was to make sure that there was a demonstrated need for a community that chose to use that one-time urban growth boundary expansion, that it be dependent on the land that was available wasn't usable and that there was an affordable crisis and, 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 and that you had a very large percentage of that that was affordable housing. That continued to get narrowed, including during the session. It came off of the major threat list from uh, the Oregon Conservation Network. And in politics, when you're working on things and people do the things you ask them to do, it makes it hard to continue to negotiate changes if you don't say well, thank you <laughs> instead of saying I'm I'm moving the ball down the line again. Um, the other issue was uh, House Bill 4002, which we were on the floor uh, late last night uh, and late last evening. It was a very long floor debate, the first time ever in 20 years that I have seen a body run out of yields. So everybody can talk for five minutes unless someone gives them their time. But I think all but about five of the three of us spoke. And um, it was a hard discussion and a difficult vote. If I were to wake up in the morning, I do not think the right thing to do is to criminalize addiction. I would like to focus on housing and services and supports and treatment. I also know that that ballot measure is so popular that there would not even need to be a campaign to pass that. If a ballot measure passed to completely repeal all of Measure 110, including all of the funding, all of those other pieces, it would be something that we could not adjust in the future because a criminal penalty that is implemented via a ballot measure requires there is a double majority of the legislature in order to make any change to it. So that's 40 votes in the House and 20 votes in the Senate. I am really proud of Senator Lieber and Representative Krupp. Um, they, it was so hard for them. I, I don't think this is something either of them ever imagined they would have to be working on. And the, the focus on trying to implement deflection is important. With that and what I said on my floor vote yesterday, that is not to say, and it is important to acknowledge, there will be disproportionate harm from this because it happens in a system that does disproportionately harm people of color, people with disabilities, low-income people. It's in the context of the state not having enough public defenders to meet our constitutional obligations and in a state where we do not have adequate access to the treatment that people need. Those are things that we all have to work on. This is a start, but I believe that this was truly the better choice than completely overturning ballot measure 110. 
People took really hard votes yesterday, and uh, I, I think the person that impressed me most yesterday, it was just one of those moments of leadership that kind of sticks with you, was um, Senator Wednesday Combos, um, who voted yes on this measure. Uh, has really been lobbied hard. She is a, a, a member of the BIPOC caucus. And what she stood up to say was that this vote was hard for her and that she knew that she had to represent her constituency and that is what she believed her constituents were telling her to do. It was a remarkable moment. She is the youngest person to ever serve in the state Senate. I believe she's 27 years old. Mm -hmm. um, and she is just so smart. So um, as you think about communicating with folks around that, there isn't a single person on that floor yesterday that did not have a hard time with that vote or a single person really that hasn't been impacted by this issue. So with that, um, I will stop, but anything you wanna talk about, let us know. Wait a minute, I have the timer going, so let me turn it off and, okay. I can use my time, I thought it was over. Oh. <laughs> okay. uh, again, there's a couple of announcements and things. There is one chair over there, and I think there's a couple of chairs in the back if you would like to come in and sit down. Uh, and this will be a chance for you to ask questions, but it should be questions, uh, not making a speech, please. So I will cut you off if you start to uh, make a speech. There you can, I will call on you. There's also cards that are being passed around uh, that you can write your question on, and I will alternate between the card questions and your questions. Um, but we're going to take a couple of minutes to uh, do a little break, and I'm going to throw out something. The, the idea for this meeting is for you to know what's going on in the legislature and not particularly for you to tell them how they should be voting or what issues you think, you know, are part. your questions will tell them. But I'm going to throw out a question that really is something that's just been an interest to me. Um, I would like to know how many of you would support a change from splitting time from daylight to standard time? <laughs> how many? I, the, so it's a three part. If you think we should keep it the same, that, that'll be what you do. If you think we should go to to uh, having the same time year round, and if that's the case, do you want it daylight savings or regulars? So, can I just say something? Yeah. I have received more emails, more passionate emails about the time than I have about land use, ballot measure 110, any health care issue, including the Corvallis Clinic, and none of you agree on anything. You can vote for me again, no matter how I vote. <laughs> Yeah, this is a straw poll. It's a chance for you to stand up and move around for a second. So all of those who like the current system of having six months one way and six months the other way or whatever hour and months it is, please stand up. Okay. All right. Okay. How many of you would like to go to a year-round time? Either way, either as if you want a year-round. But... Okay. Right. So those of you who are standing, remain standing if you want to have it year-round daylight savings. Sit down if you want to have regular, year-round regular. I want the ones that the health care, care, care says care, 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 care. because <laughs> this is a health care issue. <laughs> Changing the clocks and doing it, that's a health care issue. Okay. Yeah, it's 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 kind of yeah. 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 Can you announce the results for the people online? Can you announce what happened to the people online? Well, okay, did they, I they can't see it. Oh, the, the, the vote was a majority of people would like to go to the single time uh, year round, uh, but it seems to be split equally for those who want to have daylight saving time year round and those who want regular time year round. Uh, I want to read down. <laughs> 
anyway, this was just meant as a chance to stand up. Can I say something about that? So we did have the bill on the Senate floor. Yes. And I, I, it's one of those times I went to the Senate floor, I was no longer sure how I was going to vote when I got to the Senate floor. And neither was anyone else, which was demonstrated by the fact that some of the chief sponsors of the bill voted no. <laughs> the opponents of the bill voted yes. And four out of the five committee members, including the chair, who had unanimously voted the bill out of committee, voted no. <laughs> so it went back to the rules committee. It's now coming back to us again. Right. And the change is that, and this was really one of my concerns, I don't think it makes sense to have Oregon just be an island that has a different time in Washington and in California. It would say if Washington and California go to standard time within the next 10 years, I think it's 10, we would also go. So it will come back to the floor. Since that time, I've heard that some of the folks that agreed to that make me no longer like it either. So we'll see what happens. It is not a caucus vote. That is what it looks like when there's no rule, anything. <laughs> Can you explain why, why standard is being selected instead of daylight? Standard is being selected because we did daylight time last time, right? It's Congress. It's Congress. Yeah. Congress has to pass it, and Congress doesn't pass it, but standard we can do without going right. to the feds. It's like local control, but for the state. It's <laughs> right. Yeah. Okay. So you should vote yes. <laughs> uh, if you have a question, Connie is passing around index cards if you want to write your question. Um, I just say the questions? Yeah, but I'm done. Okay. I'll call on you first, okay? Um, so thank you all for participating in my little uh, game. That was interesting. Okay. Um, if you've got cards, hold them up so I can pick them up. Okay. All right, remember to keep your questions to a question and make them as brief as possible. Okay? And all questions will be answered by both senators. Good. Two answers? Two answers. Or you can say, I agree, and we'll alternate between which one goes first. Okay? All right. What can you do? I don't have the. The memory the because on bill numbers. So if you could expand a little on the bill number if you're gonna throw out remind us what it is. <laughs> I'm assuming this session too, so that would be all yes. I, I agree with that one. I'm not a numbered person. I don't even remember my social security number. I have to look it up every time. <laughs> so, <laughs> so yeah. So anyway. All right. Way back there in the corner. Back. I want to first start by thanking the League of Women Voters for having this session and also our uh, second representatives here. I'm glad you're both here. Um, my name is Heather Anderson. I live here in the Dallas at the between Harrison and the bottom of Whitney Hill. Yeah. Um, and the issue I'd like to raise to you is House Bill 2001, which has to do with um, uh, multiple family housing and, and increasing the capacity of most, well, I'll say, unquote, larger cities, um, making different types of housing available. In particular, I want to call out the model code that the state of Oregon prepared, which cities then could either modify or uh, adopt wholeheartedly. Um, there seems to be a travesty in our community uh, on the application of the model code that the city has adopted. And um, for us in this community, um, uh, a perfectly good house which recently sold is going to be demolished and 18 tiny cottages are going to be put on this piece of property. And so my question to both of you and with your really good expertise in the, in the Senate, I want to know if um, you're aware of the diverse ways cities are trying to implement this model code, which I think was really slapped together, even though they 2019 to, to date when that code got brought forward and then it's being implemented in 2022. Um, the, 
the variety of ways that cities are trying to implement this okay. are important. So my question is, can you fall back House Bill 2001 <laughs> to give us a reset period to more carefully look at how to implement this, a goal which we all support? Okay. Uh, so thank you. I asked Senator Anderson if I could start by going first on this one. So just so you know, on my to-do list today, based on an email that I got earlier this week, is after leaving here to drive past 36th and Lincoln. So I did get that email. I am aware of, of that. That I tried to look up on Google Maps and look through the sky, but I just really need to go see for myself to get a sense of, of what that is. Uh, and to be clear, that is for my edification only. I can't do anything about it, but I do want to better understand that concern. And it was hard for me to imagine that number of units on on that on that particular lot, as I recall it in my mind. Um, I, I think it would be hard to claw back Senate Bill 2000 or House Bill 2001. Uh, that was the landmark priority of Governor Kotak, and so it would probably be very hard to get a repeal of that signed. And I think there are a lot of good elements to that. One of the things that I was trying to understand from the letter that I received was whether that that number of units is actually required by House Bill 2001, or if that is a decision that's been made at the city level. And I think that's that's always an important thing to figure out is, and this is a question that I ask people all the time, you're upset about something, is, your, is the thing you're unhappy about in the statute, or is it in an administrative rule, or a city code, or a county code? And so that's one of the things that I am trying to get a little bit of better information about. For you. So the way that a model code came out, he said a cottage cluster must have at least four cottages on an acre of land. It never put a cap. And so this, uh, not just out of town, but out of state developer is interested in the, the turnover and what is actually student Okay, I, I suggest you talk to Sarah. And I got the letter and I will follow up and feel free to, I'm not sure who in the room sent the letter, but it was really comprehensive. It had pictures and documents. It was, it was great and I will follow up and I'm glad to set up a meeting after the session with a group of you if you'd like to talk more about that. Yeah. Uh, 2001, um, that was uh, 23, 23, 23. 2019. There's yeah. two, well, there's two. Yeah, there's 2000, two 2001. Yes. Um, but you referenced. Uh, this is the middle the, house, it's the middle this house. Is the 20, this is the 2019 one. Um, you know, I'm, I'm a big fan. I, I, I'd have to go back and look on this tools and, and, and stuff. Um, Going forward, and even as we continue to work, um, it may surprise you, even in our crisis, and let me remind you, we do have a housing crisis in this state, in all, all pieces. I'm on record of complaining that we haven't acted like it's a crisis, uh, and I'm disappointed in that. Um, and you'll hear me uh, in committee and on the floor always pushing for more production because my belief is we're going to get out of this crisis with more housing units of all types and all styles and cottage clusters serve the purpose at the right place you know uh, all income levels uh, of afforded um, affordable to them is key for me um, and Quite frankly, uh, until this session, I haven't believed um, the housing bills we've passed have concentrated to enough level on production of housing. They've done a lot of good, previous ones, they've set the stage. The problem, not the problem, but the reality of setting the stage is you don't see reality for 10 years out. And if we have a crisis today, let's deal with some short-term stuff get it going as well as long term and you know kind of go forward. The other thing that I found um, is not all cities um, and, and residents uh, of those cities uh, feel the need. Um, they've put barriers for and against housing. Uh, some intentional, some not intentional. And you know what I keep trying to do is assist those communities in seeing 
in essence, the evils of their way, uh, and offering up opportunities for, uh, especially in my district, it's not a lot of big communities. They don't have staff in cities to have expertise in housing. And quite frankly, we've recently been able to get them at their option uh, technical assistance and grants and stuff to end some model codes uh, to if they want to implement them you know it's just a, a quicker process so um, I, uh, again it's the intent necessarily is not for everybody to do the same thing but have tools have options that their community uh, is most interested and I, I can give an example, um, and I forget the bill, it might be 2001, but where the state passed the bill to allow, in essence, do away with residential zones. Is that okay? Um, in Lincoln City, we went through that process ahead of the state, but we went through it with the land use process and got the community involved. You know, and had multi flexes, four flexes, two flexes on corners and lots. And it was quite uh, an onerous process, but the community was involved. So I was quite frankly disappointed that the state, you know, ran down a bill that uh, forced everybody to, to do that. Because uh, in that case, I, I wanted the community involved and, and they made the right decision. Um, so, so that. We don't make everybody happy, but we try to give them the tools they need uh, to help us resolve this crisis. And I think one other thing that I would mention, because I'm a politician, and realize it's a way to add in something that I forgot to tell you before that's distributed. Something. <laughs> one of the, the reasons I would be concerned about having a cap on that number is it's of how many you could elect to have is there are all kinds of projects that we might not imagine and one of the questions that i had about this project when i looked at the blueprints that were there they look like tiny homes and whether or not that is the the right mix i don't know a lot about that project except for that email however in albany we have this this hub city project it's 27 tiny homes it's a remarkable project that will all of the homes it's a it'll be a um a, an association, so people will be living together in a community, making community rules together. Everyone that lives there will need to have had some history with a houselessness. There are six homes set aside for people in recovery um, from addiction or um, experiencing and needing supports around serious and persistent mental illness. There will be a peer support person that lives there. And that's 27 units on a small space, and it makes sense there. And they, they needed this zoning to do that. I think one of the things that I'm excited about that is Unfortunately, a couple of years ago, we had this ARPA funding where we had, what, like two weeks to figure out how to distribute money, and it had a lot of rules, but not a lot of rules all at the same time. I hope we never do that again. And one of them was that mine went to was this Millersburg rail crossing. That ended up not being possible to do. So three weeks ago, I got a phone call that said I got to pick a different project. So we were able to take all of the rest of that. It's about uh, $600,000, a little bit more than that, uh, that will go to that Hub City project and they will be completely debt free for all of the building all of their gardens their solar panels the greenhouse space there some of the furnishings so that all of the rents that gets paid will be able to go into upkeep and programming and they also have a plan to help individuals as they're paying their rent have that go into for many of these people the first time ever a savings account to start to build equity and have kind of emergency funds so i'm really excited about the way that that worked out and that is one of those places where there's a lot of units on a small place it's a residential street and it, it fits in the way that 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 works so it's, it's that thank you okay. i'm going to alternate actually between you know questions here and the ones that are either coming online or on the cards and I got an actually an online one and a card one that are almost identical. Um, and it says, would you be willing to co-sponsor or support a bill that would allow people who have joined an Advantage program to change back to traditional Medicare plan right then, not once a year or what I assume that would be not once a year, which is what we have now. Uh, Right on is a pretty much a one way right out to one way street. It looks like that there are some states which have switched 
pure Medicare without penalty as allowed in I guess this must be Massachusetts and Maine, but I'm not sure. So do you know anything about this? Would you be willing to support anything like this? Are we putting you on the spot? <laughs> you know, I try not to make commitments until I fully know uh, the issue and brand, brand implications. So I, I don't know what's involved in switching back and forth uh, other than I'm, I have the same issue or once a year, I guess. Uh, have to do something. Um, so I'm shorthanded there. I have yet to have personal experience with this, but I'm being closer. <laughs> I turned 50 this year. Um, but I, I'm assuming this is coming out of, for many people in our community, the, the issue with Samaritan and uh, United Health and all of these issues. So I understand the the, the pressure and the, the intensity of that need and question right now. And I don't know enough about how it works to know where the where the levers are or what a bill like that would look like. So I'm I'm open to continuing to learn about it and figuring out how people can get the coverage that they need and not be left holding the bag when again we've got this corporate influence on our medical system that is just creating a lot of disruption. And we've got to get all of that. Senator Patterson is willing to take it on. She's the person to do that. A directly okay, well, related a question is why couldn't I be getting a emails from Kaiser to invite me back into their Advantage program when I have just signed up for a different one here and they get to change it from the inside and, and it is and it's not a it's, 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 it's not following the annual requirement. That we it, it's a to. profit, you know. Well, they may just be trying to get you to do it whenever the next time comes. I mean, my reaction. <laughs> I, I don't know. Uh, do you know? I, I don't know that, but I, and it may, I don't even know if this is connected, but um, I know areas of the state will get cut out and you know, some insurance company go into business in an area. That's happened on the coast. So, I, I honestly it's, don't know uh, what all the percentage uh, point levers it's involved. It, it, it strikes me that they have some means to affect things that the public doesn't. That's the appearance that it yeah. left me with. I think this is a problem that all of us are facing in some way, and um, and we'll probably be going back to both of you with questions and things that we think might happen. Well, so. we'll get We'll get educated by yeah. Senator Patterson. Yeah, and so, if we invited okay. Senator Patterson here, would people come to a, a conversation yeah, yeah. like that? Okay. Uh, next question that was right there in the front row in the red. Do you have your hand up? Did you want to ask a question? Yeah. I just wanted to say that if we had single payer, which we should have, <laughs> here, there is a bill in the house. And that will get us there, and that would solve all these problems. Well, I think we all realize that, but it, unfortunately, it's not happening. It's happening in three years. It is happening. It is happening. Okay, good. It is happening. Okay. A question on another subject. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I don't, I don't know your name. I know some Hi. names, but not everyone. Um, this is concerning a uh, house bill. 2002. Um, I recently uh, visited the Oregon Supreme Court on a field trip in one of my classes, and they actually explained to me the difficulties that the court system is believing they are going to have with the recriminalization and kind of of drugs and expansion of certain uh, definitions. Uh, the court system has had kind of a standing rule that the possession of a large quantity of drugs doesn't exactly mean intent to deal. The legislature is planning to actually put that as a, as a law that it may mean that. Um, and we have a crisis in this state concerning uh, public defenders. And I'm, my, my question is, what is the state's plan to address a crisis that already exists and will be impacted and made worse by uh, this bill. So I'll, I'll take that one first. I, I think the first thing, and it goes back to that comment at the beginning, that is true. Um, we have a huge challenge. We are um, 
not upholding the, the constitutional rights of many defendants in the state. That's leading to a lot of people also being released because the courts have stepped in and said, hey, get them the attorney or we're releasing. We're not going to hold them anymore. This is going to make that, that crisis bigger. What would make that even bigger is the complete overturning of ballot measure 110. So it's, I mean, you really have to look at the, the way that I looked at it is Senate Bill 4, or House Bill 4002 on its own, like to just get up one day and say, hey, let's go do all of these things. And the court says, well, this isn't a good idea because of all of these impacts that it will have on an already kind of crisis driven system. That would make no sense to me. But when it, the choice is we can do this, which has this level of harm and increased complication for all of the issues that you heard from, from the courts who are not wrong versus this, I, I would rather go with this one also because we can come back in the future and change that as, as the communities become more comfortable with it. Here, it will be impossible to change. You, you can, it is so hard to get votes on criminal measures 40 and 20. Um, is hard. We've learned in the Senate around the farm issue. Twenty. It's hard to get twenty people. Right. You know what? I think you raised a point. But we've got. I, I saw the letters from the, the court system. Uh, they were certainly in testimony uh, presented. I think uh, for for me, um, the public opinion was certainly uh, the experiment. Organ experiment has failed. Uh, something needed to be done. When you, when you look at why and how the short session even came to be was work on housing, because it's a crisis, work on measure 110, reform, repeal, something. You know, those two areas were common uh, by leadership, by both uh, caucuses, everybody, the governor. And, and so, you know, something needed to be done. And as a senator, the referendum was not going to be a good thing, quite frankly. So it really puts pressure on the legislature to, to act and find a way. And her earlier statements, what went through the process, I mean, right up to the, the last days, amendments were going, going through. So um, it may still be an experiment, um, who knows? Uh, but we do know it wasn't working to the level the public wanted. You know, the, the public defender always gets thrown out, and you know, my disappointment there is we put a lot of money to public defenders last session, and yet, you know, it hasn't made a difference. Something's wrong there more than just, you know, I, I don't know. But but they got the money because they were. You know, said they needed bodies. So I know there's a couple of bills that even that the judges take a, a turn in the in public defense uh, when on their free days. Uh, so you know, it, it's it's a continuation. It's an issue. It's a crisis. It remains. Um, so we couldn't just let it stay. Stay. So, sorry, I guess my, my, if I wasn't clear, I was just asking, does the legislature, legislature have a plan to kind of address that issue or like, or any of the issues around to that? I, I think the plan is to continue working on those issues. I, I think the work that went into, so the money last session around the public defenders was not as much as they, I, I would I would say it's not as much as they, they needed. Like it, the problem is so big and so longstanding, but there is a, there is work that is continuing to happen, and actually, one of the key leaders in that is a, is an attorney from here in Corvallis who is doing an excellent job of, of that of that work. Um, so it's yesterday that that bill is a piece in a larger set of problems. Our system is so off balance when it comes to these issues that are all really deeply interconnected: houselessness, addiction untreated mental health, our public defense system, um, using our jails basically as the place that people go if they need 
treatment for anything. That doesn't make sense. And we didn't land there in a day or a session. It's going to take a number of, of years and a lot of money to get to that place. And it means people also have to do other things that are uncomfortable to them. I, I think that's one of the other reasons why I was able to get there on the housing package. I know that even though it feels really far away from a from a defense attorney or a public defender, it, it all comes together. One of the reasons we get, need so many public defenders is we have so many defendants, and there are social determinants that lead to that. Yeah, one one of the things, just an observation. Uh, I certainly don't have the years, um, <laughs> Senator, does, but you know, I, I found uh, in the building um, there's an attitude that you know you. you introduce some bills, work it through, and you're fortunate if you get it passed. And then you kind of wash your hands of it, and you know, we celebrate uh, passing a bill. Uh, it must be for campaign reasons or something. And then you know, we wait for implementation. And virtually in my long four-year tenure, I'm still working on implementation through agencies and what the rules and everything else that I passed got passed in 21 and 22. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, the public um, doesn't, you know, your expectations are, are real because we don't manage expectation, expectation very well. Uh, and I, I keep going back to, to this um, Measure 110 reform and how. Um, I'm fortunate enough to be uh, having some housing projects that got funded uh, in 21 session in Lincoln City uh, still aren't finished. You know, they're, uh, and, and they're actually projects I worked on as mayor, so even before me, and, and they're not living units, livable yet. They're under construction, and so I'm, uh, but, but I guess, you know, think about the time frame that these kind of things take. And then, you know, so this is a nice start in, you know, Measure 110 kind of activities and, and behavioral health and reform and addiction and housing, but they're just one step. I will be back, you know, with more housing, pushing production. Behavioral health is a huge issue for me. Substance abuse in my district, I am fortunate if I could get my people to any kind of support services, my people end up having to go to Baker City or Cabalas, and we're just now getting a couple of units because of earlier Measure 1 money, um, and that's been a couple of years. So I'm pushing selfishly for my district for services. It's a struggle. So you you also passed Senate Bill 5204, which provided some $211 million of funding that will, won't will take care of what you're saying entirely, but at least you they heard and tried to. The other thing I heard this morning is the Joint Addiction Committee is going to continue. And so the issue that you just brought up is important. I and mean, I think one of the issues with that, if I can just add, that the money got was assigned. We did that two years ago as well. We were really excited about, you know, kind of historic investments in mental health and housing and community-based mental health treatment and addiction treatment. The money is there, the policy is there, and it didn't happen. Yeah. I mean, we have um, shovel ready. I mean, there's a there's a program in the Portland area, substance abuse treatment for teens. It's not just shovel ready, the shovels are moving. And they needed $6 million so that there could be 20 more beds in that facility to treat kids. And it couldn't get Get through the OHA process. So part of, I think what Senator Anderson is talking about, is it's not enough to just pass it. We have to make sure those things actually happen. And that's where I think the legislature also has a role in oversight. How, how are the funds used? How do we make it happen? Because we can just throw money and say we did our thing, but if it's not better for all of you, that is not money well spent. And the workforce, you know, we haven't even talked about the workforce to support the like, structures, yeah. whether it's housing or, you know, mental health and right. prediction. So, you know, you've got so much stuff going, but it's a long time to ramp up to the, the need, uh, not to make excuses, just trying to paint the picture of reality. Let, let's, let's continue. The last question is in the audience, so I'm going to take a, a paper one. Okay, this one is. 
Does the increasing risk of wildfire, wildfires play any role in how future land use laws may be changed? Such as listing wildfire as a natural, and this is what I'm not sure. Hazard. Ha hazard. <laughs> okay. That's what I thought it was, but it ran out of. So, the, I mean, well, you know, this is something that you're. Land use is my favorite, you know, and uh, <laughs> I've come to uh, uh, what is it, 50 some years old? And from what I can tell, we don't want to touch it with a 10 foot pole. You know, uh, you know it's just such minor changes, you know, go down in defeat. Um, but, uh, you know, it, I don't know. Um, I, I think uh, the, the whole idea of uh, land use is to provide the growth of communities. You know, and in a controlled manner. And uh, I've said before, you know, I'm not visioning or advocating for a Las Vegas style expansion, the Phoenix or anything else. And again, in my district, I don't have that kind of land anyway. It's flat and just keep rolling. Um, I do get concerned. The question that has in my district again, as you met, uh, east, I got the coast range, um, forest, and you know, human occupation, you know, close to that. I think we've got we passed the bill last session about you know uh, making those structures and land certainly uh, more defensive uh, against wildfire uh, threats. Uh, that makes sense. Uh, we know more today also about um, how the materials to use um, and not use. And, you know, at the same time, and I know it's not all forest building, because, uh, you know, just look at Texas burning, they don't have trees. Um, so it, it's just being sensitive. Um, good management in the forest, especially close to, um, you know, to that, uh, where humans are, makes makes good sense. So I hadn't, hadn't thought, quite frankly, of, you know, uh, land, and land use somehow bringing in the, the topic. I don't know where where one would do it. Um, it's goal yeah. seven. Goal seven? Yeah. <laughs> goal seven is natural hazards. Natural hazards, thank you. Okay. So it's an anomaly to be a person from Corvallis where land use is not my area of expertise, <laughs> but it's all of your area of expertise. I, I'm pretty convinced this is the land use district in the, in the state, and a lot of you are experts. Um, I, I don't, I can't speak to, to goal seven or how it would fit into the planning, but I, I do think that fire and other uh, consequences of climate change have to be built into all of the policies that we are making. I think you you saw that again in the in the housing production, but I can't use the numbers right now because I, it, we're just a couple weeks in and it's not been enough time to get the numbers right. But I, I appreciated that part of what went along with that was that we're not just the affordability standards, but also um, kind of emission standards. What are we looking at in terms of green building standards to, to build things that are more sustainable? I also think, and I'm again thinking back, not to pick on you again, Peter, but I got to be out and and um, kind of do a drive around and a conversation with him. And I've been thinking about a, um, just kind of a tract of, um, of trees that are kind of threatened by this invasive pest. And one of the things I've been thinking about since that time is as we have these changes, whether they come from an invasive pest or a, or a wildfire, if the land itself changes as a consequence of that, what does that, how do we protect those things from happening, but also how do we respond after that time? Does that mean that we enhance protections on um, on the places that we have left um, and 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 make up for that in, in places that aren't what they were when they started to mitigate that overall harm? I don't know what the answers to those are, but I have just been thinking a lot more about our land is different than it was because of climate change. And we have to have responses to that, whether that's in the land use code or, or elsewhere. If again, it, it seems appropriate to uh, visit a little bit about wildfires in general. And um, my district, Lincoln City, Lincoln County, North Park was adversely affected in 2020 with the fires. I'm still working with survivors of that, uh, victims of that fire, 
uh, to get services, get rebuilt, get resettled into the, the community. Now we were fortunate, we only lost only 350 structures. Um, and what didn't make it to the city, so it was county uh, kind of stuff. And uh, you know, it's been enlightening because uh, it's things we don't, I didn't think about. Um, as someone settles with an insurance company or settles with uh, suits, you know, their settlement is tax. We just passed a bill that would you know, unwind that, so it's not tax. Because by the time, you know, especially a settlement, you, you tax it and then you pay attorneys and everybody else, you know, they, they end up not with enough to rebuild. And of all things, I want those people back in the communities, the community needs them. And the same thing happens then on, on property tax. As they build their new unit, they get taxed at the going rate and at the going value, you know, of their new unit. So, you know, they may have been paying because it was older, much lower property taxes, and then replace it, and they get slammed sometimes a double, three times as much. So we put it also past the provision where it's up to the county to kind of monitor this and decide, but uh, would be taxed at their old, old assessment, the original assessment prior to the fire, you know, on, on the square feet of the, the building. If it was 2,000 square foot house and they built a 3,000 square foot house, for example, the first 2,000 would be uh, taxed at the old rate, the other thousand would be at the new deal value. So, what we're the point being is, you know, it, it's amazing again. Three and a half years later, you know, we're still dealing with, you know, things how people are negatively impacted with a fire, and I think it's it's worthwhile to keep bringing that up. Um, because it, it makes the point of why we should make some changes, why we need to be much more uh, aware of uh, what's going on, whether it's climate change, environment, or how we do this. Okay, another question. I've been on that side. Is there anyone on this side? Yes, right here. Hi, uh, yeah, thank you both for being here. Um, I wanted to ask, as the lives lost in Palestine totals over this uh, That's not a, a, a I'm that's sorry, it is a question. I'm getting there. Are there any attention not, thoughts not not on not those? Either issue. you can Please speak continue. on focus on money or you can trade trying. with Israel and have ranked third in the state's exports, which include tech and weaponry. And I believe a lot of those trades and that money could be used for the interests that both of you are talking about today, mm -hmm. including education. So I, I'm happy to, to respond. I mean, there's a lot of communication about, about this issue. Um, so uh, first, it is true. We don't have a direct voice in, in making these changes. Um, we had a situation this week in the Senate, and it was, uh, we had a, a group that came, and it was a group of youth uh, from uh, uh, a filmmaking group for, for youth who had been um, unhoused or homeless. So I, I think the performers were probably in their early 20s, they probably late teens, early 20s, and uh, they performed uh, Shakespeare. And it was a pretty compelling presentation of, Shakespeare is always kind of amazing in the way that it was to be or not to be. And at the end, um, and the, the role of our opening ceremonies, it's supposed to be totally apolitical. You sing a song, you say a prayer, you read a poem, and then we're all happy and we move on. And the, the young person, one of the young people grabbed the mic walking off and shouted, Free Palestine. And it was quiet on the floor, and I sat and, and thought about that for a little bit. This is an issue that is, I think, really difficult for people to talk about. It is hard to find the right words to describe the complexity of tragedy and injustice for people in Israel and Palestine that has gone back for generations. And it's impossible to figure out how to have words that encompass an absolute rejection of the of the activities of October 7th and terrorism in general, and to reject the devastation of entire lines of families and 
and communities and, and the loss of life and children that we see every day. What happened for me when that kid said that, I felt very internally, sorry, <laughs> I felt very internally challenged about my own fear to talk about that in a, in a public way. And maybe that is a problem with solving some of these issues is when we're too scared that what we say is going to disappoint or hurt someone if we're cautious in doing that. And if we could have those conversations in, in very honest and non-performative kinds of, of ways. And so I went out to talk to that young woman and I was surprised to find, or that young person, um, and I was surprised to find Senator Bonham, a Republican colleague of mine, meet me out there. And he sat down with her and he was saying, sat down with them and was saying to them, uh, that they probably didn't see the same on that issue or many other issues, but he really respected her courage and an act of civil disobedience and that they should take the slap on the wrist they were going to get with, um, with pride and reflect that there's consequences to that. And then he shared how he stood um, on a principle that was important to him and his consequence is that the courts ruled he can't run again, you know, kind of that denial of form. And my response to that young person was, that probably that person and I have more policy views in common than they do with Senator Bonham, but that I also respected that courage and that the impact that they had had was that they challenged me to be as courageous as they were and that the next time that I was asked about that in a public place, I would answer the question. And so that's why I really, I feel like that is a promise I made to that young person that day. And so I apologize for jumping in, but it's important to me to keep those promises. And I hope we can all find a way to talk about these things because I think we're all heartbroken by what we see. And I think we're all touched and connected in this world to people who are impacted um, by the events of October 7th that are impacted by what's happening in Gaza and I think there's a, a lot more love in all of that that connects us than than division. And you know, if any of us had the answers of how to flip that and find that, the world would be a better place. But you know, if we talk about it more, maybe we can get there. I agree, and I do think the conversation can start here in the state of Oregon with that because we are all contributing to what's happening right now. Thank you. Well, if you'd like to organize a conversation and invite people, I encourage you to do that. But we're going to continue to talk about what's happening. The legislature. Recording in progress. Was I silenced? No. No, the recording hadn't started before. I forgot okay. to start. <laughs> okay, the next. Right, we have an next question is um, one of the paper ones, and it's what is the status of campaign finance reform <laughs> right now? I don't know. <laughs> Something yep. happened yesterday, and I have not caught up yet on what that is. What else? Oh, did it pass the house? I think so. Yeah, I thought it passed something, but yeah. Yeah, I think it passed the house forty nine to something. Like mm -hmm. the yeah. Does anybody? The legislature that the league does not support because right. the league is supporting IP9, which is collecting signatures. Um, this is, was the legislation that passed was um, a compromise between Oregon Business and Industry and the SEIU unions. There have been several. It's on to the Senate. Yeah, but there have also been several newspaper articles and so forth discussing this both the bill and the initiatives that are going out and what might happen. House Bill 4026, I believe. Okay. Thank you. All right. Next question in the back, back there. Um, Mark Weiss, I'm chair of Mid Valley Healthcare Advocates, and uh, mostly what I want to do is thank you. Thank you for passing universal health care. I think a whole bunch of folks in the room don't know that this actually happened. Senate Bill 1089 in the last session. And thank you for naming such a strong governing board for that project. Uh, I look forward to universal health care, Oregon being the first state with universal health care in about three years. Um, mostly, though, I want to say thank you for serving. This is a really 
difficult time in our country, in our community, in our world. And uh, I am grateful for everyone who has the courage to step forward and serve. with a couple of those folks, folks right here <laughs> and thinking all of you you know the courage to take that risk because there are risks and um, to put yourself out for some of these wonders okay, next question and this i think this i think there was a third one but i've forgotten now we're dealing with this same issue uh, so I will try to combine the questions, but it says HB 4130, which is intended to protect providers and something from corporate abuse. And this is the stand on corporate practice of medicine. So uh, what do you stand? What do you think? Is it going to come to a, a Senate floor vote? Is it going to pass? Where does it stand? So I, I'm a co-chief sponsor of that of that measure. I I like the bill. Um, I would hope. I, I hope it comes to the Senate floor. It it went back to rules. Um, I, I think there's a, a short session challenge. The the bill was in the committee. It was very fast. The the chair was trying to get through that and the other pieces, and um, they, they weren't able to get through all of the testimony. And sometimes the process matters a lot to how something does on the floor. And so I think everyone's trying to figure out how to how to work through that. I, to me, my worry is that House Bill forty one thirty is many 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 years too late. And that part of the challenge is how do we start to unwind that? And then how many of you here know uh, Norm Castillo? Yeah, like one of the heroes of my life. He was my family doctor. He delivered Sam, took care of Sam when he was young. And we spent a lot of time back yeah, 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 yeah. And he talked a lot to us in the early 90s about pharmaceutical companies and kickbacks and consolidation and corporate takeover and the need to maintain independent positions and all the things that would happen if we didn't act to stop those things. And as I talked to folks last week, I referenced this earlier in the with the Corvallis Clinic situation. It was just like, wow, the prophecy of Norm Castillo come, you know, come to pass. Like very literally and within the systems that he was that he was talking about. So I um, I, I think it would be easier and less divisive among physicians who many of whom are now within these organizations. And it's interesting to see the letters come in, independent physicians, very, very supportive, um, physicians in organizations that are corporate owned in a different in a different place. It, the further you get down the road, the harder it is to to reel it back in. And you end up with these impossible situations like the the folks at the Corvallis Clinic find themselves in right now. Sarah, tell us what the bill is. So it's the do you want to you're on the committee. Do you want to <laughs> so the, the bill, it, and it has a the longest runway I've ever seen a bill. It's got a seven year runway, and it's in its current form uh, to to really go into effect. But it requires that the majority of the ownership of an organization be actual physicians, not one. So that you can't have one physician in name only. That is the. Um, the ownership of you know hundreds of clinics all across the country and the the idea is to put these protections in place to ensure that physicians can continue to make medical decisions so you know one of the other elements in there are non-compete agreements that you can't be forced to do what you're told by kind of the, the corporate policy because you're in a place where you either work there or you can't work anybody place else because of your um your, your non-disclosure agreement. It's a lot of these little pieces that that get put put in, and that that essentially is what it does. It's very narrow. Um, it doesn't impact hospitals. It doesn't impact mental health, which I really think it needs to impact behavioral health. We have huge issues in that area, and that's the place that I have the most experience with United, which is the or UHS, which is the parent company of Optum. But I, we'll see where it goes. It's a it's a big bill, and uh, Representative Bowman, Bowman has been working really hard, really really hard on it. And um, I, I have not had the chance to go back to watch the Senate hearing, but I did hear it was interesting. 
So Seneca, if it passes, would it change what is going to happen to the clinic? No, no, it wouldn't. <laughs> Okay, I have all of these questions. There's lots of you with questions and we're almost at the end. So what I was going to do, as I've sat here and watched the snow for the last hour, <laughs> and have, which you all haven't gotten to see because you're facing us, uh, to tell us in just a couple of sentences or three sentences, what do you think was the best thing that's happened so far this session? Or the best, you know, the thing that you worked hardest for and were really glad it's it's happened, uh, you know, kind of a personal pride of something. If there is any personal pride to have for what's happened. And I appreciate all these questions. I'm assuming they'll stick around for a couple of minutes. And if you didn't get a chance, maybe you can talk to them. Well, let me start with um, my past experience of four sessions. Uh, I would make the observation of uh, this seemed to be the most collegiate uh, in my, like I say, vast experience. Um, and I'm not sure why. Um, you, I think part of it is there was a clear understanding and agreement of what the session was going to concentrate on. And I think that helped. The other is it's 35 days, so you know you can hold your nose and you know, get along with it. Um, and we ought to think about that. Of the long session, maybe shorten that, and because um, it's just personalities and in, in the building. But I, I do think um, you know another year under leadership that had uh, come about in 22 or 23. Um, so kind of that burn-in scenario. So for me, um, what was hanging over was certainly uh, in my caucus anyway, because they have the we had the ten individuals that have, uh, uh, won't be returning uh, by election. So the whole idea of uh, why would they come back at all um, kind of helped manage the short session uh, a bit and keep it focused. In in all fairness. Leadership kept their word, um, which was also a test because um, the leadership, as you know, doesn't come from my caucus, so my uh, part in your And so, you know, it, it's building trust, um, and I'd like to see that. Personally, you know, I get along with everybody um, and work both sides um, uh, and, and both chambers, so uh, I'll continue to do that. That's uh, what I've set out to do. I'm not a good party person or uh, <laughs> political. I'm more, much more interested in you know, my district, my citizens, um, and then I'll need to expand into the state market. But I, I felt neglected as a mayor and as a citizen on the coast, and, and I'm just trying to make uh, our lives uh, much more uh, equitable um, as the rest of the state. So I, I think that Okay. That was a nice, and I'm certainly happy with the housing. I carried the housing bill. I'll continue to work with the governor. She, uh, in all fairness, uh, reached out early to me um, to be a part of all her housing pieces. And that, too, I was into uh, uh, the meetings early, real early, as we knew we had money, what projects, where we could, the different bills. Um, and, you know, that's very much appreciated. And I think as I spoke inside my own caucus, others couldn't help but uh, be a little bit jealous because uh, that doesn't work. And I have a great relationship with the chair of the housing committee, uh, Senator Drama and I get along real well. You know, I both go to soccer games together, so uh, we don't wear our pins, so nobody knows us. <laughs> but, you know, mine, mine's more around the people and the personalities and the, the chemistry in the building right now. So, thank you. I, I would say that the legislature is a much more collegial place than we get credit for. I, I think on an individual level, most of us get along pretty well. Um, it's hard for me to say 
to answer that question because all of my things are pending and all of my things are in capital construction. Capital construction <laughs> is the place where all of the negotiated things land. And I'm finding that what is challenging about having been there now for about 20 years, the longer you're there, the more uh, likely it is that you've got bigger stuff that lands in capital construction. But if it comes out, what I'm really excited about, it's uh, it's called The Culture of Yes, um, Senate Bill 1557. Uh, and this bill looks at, I thought I was going to go through a whole town hall without talking about kids, but it's, oh, about, wow. kids. it's about the, the coordination <laughs> of education, mental health services, developmental disability services, and housing services to be able to keep more kids at home with their families rather than having them disrupt into foster care or go into um, kind of institutional placements. And, and this would take advantage of 10 years ago, Oregon is one of only five states that's adopted the Community First Choice Act into our state Medicaid plan, which means it's an entitlement in our state plan that if you are a person that's at risk of being placed in an institution, the state is supposed to provide you with home and community-based supports. These are the types of supports that we provide to aging Oregonians to help them age in place in their homes and that we apply um, provide to people with um, intellectual and developmental disabilities. You know, those one-on-one -on -one supports that help people with job training and in the community or respite. What we have not implemented in that 10 years is that kids with significant mental illness are entitled to those same benefits under our existing state plan today. Mm -hmm. So what Senate Bill 1557 does, it acknowledges that we're not there yet. It says that we will comply with that. It creates a series of reports to come back um, through a coordinated effort of the Oregon Health Authority and ODHS in October and again in March to start looking at how we put the infrastructure together for that and move it forward and recommendations about how we can um, expand our waivers and create a, a waiver for children with severe mental illness so that they can become Medicaid eligible regardless of their uh, parents' income so they can get those services. And, and for CME, this also impacts our public schools because if we forgive parental income for medically fragile kids and kids with significant behavioral issues, we can get 100% Medicaid reimbursement for our nursing services for those students, for behavior support services, and there's accountability that comes with it because to bill, it has to be provided to the student and it has to be by an appropriate provider. We're talking about, you know, over $100 million of additional money into our state school fund that we don't have to put up a match for. Uh, so if we can, if we can get this done and we can get it across the finish line, um, it will be a really, it'll be a really big deal. We've got families that have just been in crisis for years that are very excited about a world in which you're not told, report your kids to the police and we'll take them to jail and maybe meet them there or drop them off at the emergency room and get charged with neglect for not taking them home because you don't know how to get them safe. That is the most ridiculous public policy I've ever heard of and we can fix it and, and this bill puts us on the road to do that within just a couple years. So if we do that, that will actually why I ran the legislature. So that's very much. <laughs>